Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm returning today uh, to end the saga with Michael Kester. Oh man, I, for I totally forgot this is one of our infamous journeys, isn't it? It is a, I think we used to call them adventures, we've never called them adventures. I'm going to call no. it that right now to separate okay. it from Rocky right. and Asia. This is, I don't know, I don't remember what we ended up calling it, but in my notes I was referring it to Skettyzilla. Skettyzilla. That's, yeah. I don't think I've ever heard that before. This yeah. is new to me. So we're going to call it the Skettyzilla saga. That's fine. It started, what, geez, two years ago almost? Yeah, I think it was December. Yeah. December 2010. So it was yeah. year three of Double Feature. Yeah. So And we did Gojira with A Fistful of Dollars. Oh, man. And then right about the time everybody had forgotten we did that. Including us. Right. We went and we did uh, Gamera the Great and Powerful or something with um, a few dollars more. Guardian of the Universe, I think it Guardian was. of the Universe, that's what it was. Gamera, Guardian, Gamera, of, the Guardian of the Universe. Gamera, Guardian of the Universe. Yeah. Um, and then today... Here we are finishing it up with Godzilla Final Wars and the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly you can find pretty much anywhere, I think. But uh, mm -hmm. Final Wars is on Crackle for free. Crackle's a video website. I couldn't find it anywhere else. Okay. So, <laughs> so it was, uh, I, I want people to see Godzilla Final Wars. And, it, you know, you can't go rent movies anymore. This is a very interesting time. For trying yeah. to find films without buying yeah. them. I don't know how anyone's doing this. I don't either. So this is, it started as, you know, the adventure of movies double feature will never be ready for. Right. And here we are years later, and I still don't, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, it's yeah, what, I know. the it, most talked about movie ever. Probably, I think on the uh, IMDb charts, which is the only charts that we actually pay attention to. And by pay attention to, I mean are familiar with how to find. <laughs> right. It's probably in the top three of the greatest films of all time, right? It's like probably Shawshank Redemption and then... Something like that. Something else Scorsese did and then, I don't know. <laughs> right. Honestly, I don't know what's in the top ten list, but it's probably this movie because it's long. So we're going to spoil it, but uh, what I was getting at is you've already seen the movie. Yeah. I don't get to say that a lot, but you've definitely seen this movie already. or maybe Unless you you're me. Unless you're me. In which case, uh, it took until a few hours ago to have seen this movie. Six hours ago, because we watched the movie. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, Godzilla: Final Wars is nobody has uh, seen. I assume nobody's seen it, but you should, you know, Except go me. over to Crackle and watch it for free. Doesn't cost any money. Just go watch it. Um, I wanted before we rolled into this, I want to thank the small number of people who are still giving monthly donations. Before I forget, oh, that's so nice. Because you know, I've been. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I've been kind of depressed. And I'm ending every show with, hey, what the fuck, give us some money. Because that's, you know, that's what makes me happy in this world yes. is people Life is hard these days. giving me money. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, we haven't talked about these people in a while, but there's a thing on the website where you can go on and subscribe and give like four fifty a month or something. $4.50 a month. Cents. I think it's set up to give 5 bucks a month. And okay. then PayPal, you know, uh, takes their blood money. Anyways, point was, there's a couple people that, uh, too small a number, but a couple people that do that, and I am infinitely thankful for those. Thanks, guys, for still thank doing you. this. God damn, thank you. To be honest, the reason I really like that is I know there's still people who listen to the show, and the right. number is at least the same as the number of people who give money. I assume. That's true, unless they forgot it's happening. Yeah, those people have died, and their credit card is just still linked yeah. on PayPal. How much somewhere. is Rob Zombie donating every month? I want to start with the good, the bad, and the ugly. All right. It seems like so far, I remember, you know, that was at a Are point... Are you just talking about the sheer length of the film? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when we started watching the good, the bad, and the ugly 100 years ago. Yeah. No, I mean the Dollars Trilogy, man. We first started right. talking about those, and your immediate surprise was that... Um, fistful of dollars was not dirty Harry, right? <laughs> that was so. That's about you know it kind of sets the stage for what you mm -hmm. should expect from our show. I think uh -huh. 
Yeah, so it's the Dollars Trilogy or the Man With No Name Trilogy, um, preceded by a fistful of dollars and a few dollars more. Right. And on the show before, you know, we've gotten a pretty exhaustive coverage of that trilogy because we've talked about all the Ojimbo stuff. You remember all of that when it started? I do, yes. And the um, the popularization of the Spaghetti Western. Mm -hmm. As we went through and we started to see uh, other types of Spaghetti Westerns, you know, stuff that's a little grittier, a little more exploitative. This was always still, well, this is where it got popular. This is the pop of Spaghetti Westerns. Sure, right. And we've talked about that, and we've talked about dubbing. So now we've finally arrived at this last chapter, and that lets us get pretty heavy into, I want to talk about themes mostly. Okay. And I suppose what sets this one apart from the previous two. So, I mean, I, I gotta, the first thing I want to say about this movie is that I've never seen it before or had never seen it before. Sure. And that to me, this is the first time on Double Feature that I've been white catted. Oh yeah, sure. It's the first time that we've gone into a movie and I've been, you know, I sit there and I have my notepad out and my pen ready and I'm ready sure. to be overwhelmed with a glut of what cinema ought to be. And uh, then there's title cards. Right. And <laughs> it's just a longer one of all these other spaghetti westerns. And I mean, yep. it has... It has certain depth and certain body, but it's not the kind of movie where you have to sit with squinted eyes waiting for random tight-lipped exposition of the thematic elements. It's there. And that's, that's the thing that I think you and I often forget about films that are hailed as the greatest films of all time is the reason they're decided to be the greatest films of all time is because everybody gets them. Yeah, they can still be friendly. They're not out to scare you. You know, it's a big film for us because so many people have talked about it. I, I always fear, like, oh, man, we're going to get something wrong or we're going to overlook this big thing. But it's, it's that very fear that I think turns people away from film discussion. Yeah. You know, when you have, when you have friends, you'll go see a movie with them and they just don't want to talk about it afterwards. You know, uh -huh. you, you probe them with some questions. They're just not interested in answering any of life's moral dilemmas sure. or you know what i mean just, yeah. oh i thought it was pretty good you know it wasn't boring yeah. or anything i had a good time <laughs> what do you right. want to do now you know what i mean yeah and i think a lot of that comes from i mean people you know just different strokes right but people also they're afraid of that they're afraid to listen in on something of uh, film analysis in general is it tends to be you know a word like pretentious might describe yeah. it um, it's heavy, it's not approachable, it's not understandable. And I fucking hate that. I just hate it. Yeah. I hate that, you know, people make art and you're afraid to talk about it for fear mm -hmm. that you might look like an idiot. You might, that you not might get it wrong. That yeah. you might get it wrong. Yeah. When in reality, you don't really need to know where any of this stuff was coming from. You, you don't need to know anything outside of how it spoke to you. That's yeah. really all you need. Interpretation is based on the individual and not based on the worldview of some piece of art. So a lot of times, you know, when you hear some people come to something with a large body of understanding about why something was created in the way it was, then they all come from the same point of objectivity. Right. You know, when we all know a film's backstory, we all start telling the same stories. It's uh, the Glengarry Glen Ross. Right. Oh, that... That Alec Baldwin part Alec wasn't Baldwin, even supposed, yeah. supposed to be in there. You know, everybody talks right. about that. But when you show somebody who's lived in a fucking vacuum and they that's don't know me. anything that's about me. it. Yeah. Yeah. Then you With find a movie, lot more that's interesting me. points. Sure. It lets you just, you know, I was watching, um, I've been watching a lot of the Kevin Smith stuff lately. I think it's because you told me about comic book men. Uh huh. So I went and watched that. And then I was watching, he did a, uh, a thing called burn in hell about red state. And it was all of this backstory. And, you know, those stories are incredible. And I'm really glad I didn't know about any of them when we came on Double Feature because I would have right. been just doing Kevin Smith's stand up. Sure. You know? Yeah. And so that's how I feel about the notability for a lot of these things is it makes them popular and it makes them unapproachable. But I don't feel like people should be afraid of them. Right. Like you said, going into this, I mean, it's a long spaghetti western. So long. It's, uh, but so spaghetti western was more. It's Maybe so I didn't. So spaghetti. I didn't emphasize the uh, yeah the right thing there. 
uh, you start with the titles and, you know, that's the exploitative iconography of the, the, there's a character that's the good, there's a character yeah. that's the bad, and there's a character that's the ugly. I had no idea that the good, the bad, and the ugly were three people. Yeah, right. I right. didn't realize that. I thought the good, the bad, and the ugly was kind of this. I thought it was going to be a, a point of interpretation where you go, well, who's the good and who's the bad and who's sure, the ugly sure. and who's the ugly in the world? Right. And aren't we all a little in, ugly? In real life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Isn't there a little of the good, the bad, and the ugly in all of us? But instead, it's Clint Eastwood is the good, Lee right. Van is the bad. Tuco is the ugly. And when these characters are introduced, my favorite thing for everything the good, the bad, and the ugly has given us and how it's been parodied and the phrase has been used, I always think about the actual titles because that's one of the most exciting parts for, you know, you see the ugly first. He uh, shows up through a window, you know, going right. through a window and he gets this, uh, gets this title, boom, ugly. And then we see Lee Van Cleef, and we know what's coming. They're going to tell us yeah. what each character is. And we're trying to figure out not only which one is he, but what he's going to do to define the title. That's exactly what I was getting at. Yeah, because yeah. he doesn't get the badge right away. Yeah. He doesn't get the bam, Lee Van Cleef, you know, whatever. And so I'm excited because you're going, oh, what's his moment going to be where they go, he's the good guy, he's the bad guy. You know, what's he going to do right. to, uh, he has to earn that. Yeah. And what's even better is, you know, from then on, everything he does that doesn't make the title show means something more awesome than that yeah, thing is exactly. coming. You know yeah, what I mean? Something more definitive will declare him as the bad. Right, right. So when you finally get to that moment, and that's the, it's not really a double cross. It's a double payoff in his right. it's, opening I mean, it's, scene. Yeah, it, it paints him as a financially driven mercenary with only loyalty to his self. And then you have the character of the good who puts on a show of capturing and freeing Tuco between right. towns. And yeah. that's your, you know, that's your good guy. I think that the good and the bad are two of the most interesting elements of the film because without the title cards, I was wondering the whole time if I could have decided which one was which. Sure. You get the kind of element where the good avoids capital punishment, mm -hmm. which I guess in a way paints him as more of an angelic being well that's what he gets his card for right he gets right. his oh exactly. but he's saving a life the yeah. good you know but the bad i mean if you look at if you look at angel eyes character mm -hmm. his arc really isn't that much worse than any of the other characters except he's the bad guy yeah they call him the bad guy and he initiates somebody to get the shit beat out of them but if you go back into fistful of dollars that's nothing that the man with no name may not have done. Yeah, we talked about that sort of absence of personal morality there, or no, no real code, just um, being completely bankrupt. A lot of the stuff, I, I feel like I can't spoil that movie for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with that. But if you go back and listen, that I think that was part of our conversation there. And it seems like, in retrospect, it was very simplistic, our take on that. Here's a world where people don't have any morality. They're all, you know, mean gunslingers. But I did want to talk a little bit about, you know, the idea of a worldview. And if we can get a little more nuance now that we're looking at three characters that look pretty identical, but the film, the whole point is, you know, making a distinction between them. Sure. I like thinking about worldviews because it helps you guess how someone will react in a situation before it happens. Right. It, like a political ideology or... You know, I'm libertarian, right? We've talked about libertarians sure. on the show before. We lean far left on social freedoms, far right on monetary policy. All I have to do is tell you that, and then you could name an issue and pretty much figure out, well, what does he think about that? Right. And so you look at the worldview of these characters. You kind of look at what drives them. It'll help you anticipate their motives later on, especially when you're going through a three-hour epic like this mm -hmm. but i'm wondering a lot about that i mean what is their moral code what do you think is important to these well, people I, you know it's i think really it's weird because the entire film comes down to two hundred thousand dollars yeah i mean that's what the film that's Every, what's everybody it, wants the jackpot that's what's important yeah um i think that the interesting aspect of motivating all three characters with the exact same thing is you get to see how people with three different moral codes go about obtaining something they all know they don't really deserve. Sure, sure. Um, 
but that thing is the thing. So you would agree that that is what drives them. Sure. It's well, not like if, they're in it for different, you know, we kind of saw different agendas uh, the last couple of movies, but this mm -hmm. is everybody just wants the prize. It's all about getting that money and it's all about, I mean, you never find out what they want to do with the money. That's right. not of any importance. Nope, not at all. The only real thing that I ever see that seems to be motivational aside from getting the money is maybe preventing somebody else from having the money. Sure, sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that Blondie has a certain certain part of his motivation is about not letting Angel Eyes get the money and also about not letting Tuco be the only one who gets there because he right. feels like Tuco's undeserving of such a prize. Yeah, so in a way it's kind of about competition just as much as that prize. It's uh I think that's what makes eBay work, right? Like you sure. don't, yeah. you don't necessarily want a thing. You're just in, emotionally invested in it. Uh, at yeah. this point, people bid crazy amounts uh, past what an object is worth. Sure, you know this is um, something we see as a primary driver in all different facets of society. You know, when you look at something one person is going after and how they obtain that, mm -hmm. it's at a lot. A uh, slower pace or in a different way than if you put another person into that group and say, okay, now you're both going for this thing and only one of you right. is going to get it. Sure. Suddenly you're moving pretty quick. And so that's definitely, I mean, that's going to be a built in driver for those characters. I think anytime they are, uh, you see three people in a movie going for something when only one person can have that. Mm -hmm. But different characters are more or less concerned about is somebody else going to get it? And do they deserve know, it? And what are they going to do with it? You don't want to see them victorious over yourself. If anybody, right. not them, <laughs> just right, give exactly. it to anybody. Don't give sure. it to that guy. That kind of reflects um, another big point of contention. The film has with the scene with the bridge mm -hmm. where it's eventually that scene boils down to neither of them really care about winning the bridge. The whole purpose is to prevent the other side from getting the bridge. Right. Because right. it's a it's a key point in the war. And I think that it's supposed to be an extrapol I think it's a very, very obvious extrapolation of what the film is saying in a global sense. Sure. In a social sense even. But it's about two parties at that point because the ugly, you know, the ugly and the good are essentially on the same side for different reasons or because they have to. Mm -hmm. and an unholy alliance isn't that the that's kind yeah, of the idea right? right no alliance is too unholy to get to sure. the thing you want yeah and uh and so we have this bridge which signifies it doesn't signify a prize it signifies preventing the other side from yeah. obtaining the prize right. nobody care nobody gives a shit right it's right. just the only thing they care about is that the other person doesn't win the ebay auction yeah <laughs> that's it to try and figure out what everybody's about in this movie, another thing that motivates people or another way to look at a worldview, I guess, is to think, you know, who do these people feel like they're held accountable to, right? I mean, who are they looking out for? You know, you think about uh, some people doing good in the name of, uh, like, say, religion, right? Because mm -hmm. of uh, fear of God's judgment. I have to do good because someone's watching me. You and I are atheists. I mean, we do good by sure. humanity or by each other, among a lot of reasons, I guess. Yeah. But these people, I mean, this is a very interesting look at completely separate from any kind of uh, religion or humanism. It's a look, mm -hmm. uh, maybe broadly, at individualism. Yeah. At just looking out for yourself and not even really to try and defend that in any way. Uh, people always write us uh, emails every time I mention Ayn Rand on the show. They get very, very worked up. <laughs> but a lot of the Ayn Randian ideas were, hey, it's okay to be selfish, and here's why. Yeah. And these Westerns are more, um, I mean, a large amount of the Westerns are, this man is looking out for himself. I don't need to tell you why. Sometimes you just need to look out for yourself. Sure. Well, I think I think that's what the Western setting allows for is... It's a lawless point in history. Yeah. You have to look out for yourself because every man is for themselves in the Old West. Right. And no one's going to watch your back because anybody who may say they're going to watch your back is just out to get your share of whatever you have. Sure. That, I think, is what the Old West most easily represents in cinema is a time where you are never safe and you have to constantly be looking out for yourself. 
and making your own way the whole time. Well, and I think that's why you see something like The Unholy Alliance that becomes such a critical part of a lot of these films. Because if you're going through life and saying, you know, you, you have to look out for yourself, it's just you, you're in this alone, then trust is going to be a big theme for you. Sure. I mean, where do you find trust? Do you trust anybody? If exactly. you're just going to if you're going to be 100% self-sustaining, then by definition you're looking to trust no one. Right. Well, and and how much money does it cost for you to start trusting somebody? Exactly. You know, yeah. how much money is worth trusting someone you know you can't really trust? You know, you get that crucial moment where they each have a piece of information, they have to go in this together and you know, they play off of that through the whole movie who's side is who on and who has to who is the unholy alliance at that particular time and i think that's how these movies invite trust into a world that by definition has to have none of it right just says uh we're devoid of trust it's just me i'm in this alone ah crap i need this thing hey you come with me for a while yeah i wanted to talk about the other part that stands out to me a lot which is the treatment of war uh in this movie I think apart from the morality, that's probably the thing that's always been the most interesting thing to me. It's almost a pacifist film. Yeah, um, it definitely is. Which is interesting for a film that's considered to be so violent to have themes that one could argue are pacifist themes. And I mention that only because I think a large segment of our audience specifically is is driven towards violent films and might not even realize they're watching what a lot of people call a very violent film. Yeah, it's always interesting to see what gets chalked up as a violent great movie. Yeah, because right. Because the films that I would even consider violent wouldn't even enter the territory of cinema history. <laughs> sure. Sure. At least in the in the you know in the ac academic sense. Right. Uh in your and my sense, something like Martyrs or something like Hostile Two, yeah, is is it's up on the wall of great cinematic achievements, but they're never going to make it on the IMDb top ten. I say that only to provide a little bit of context when the movie starts really invoking, um, you know, conversation about sure. uh, war and about violence. When they first get to that uh, that sort of camp or the bridge scene you're talking about, mm -hmm. the guy they encounter, you know, the guy who's talking about. Um, what does he say about whoever has the most liquor or yeah, whoever right. can get That's the soldiers? The thing, it's the only thing that both sides have in common. Whoever can get the soldiers the most drunk to send them to be slaughtered is the winner. These are, he uses the word slaughter. I mean, he uses, he constantly calls it a slaughter over and mm -hmm. over. Hey, come look at the spectacle. Come look at the, the slaughter. This is going to be a bloody mess. And much like how the protagonists don't really talk about why they need the money, the, you know, the motivation, uh, is the motivation is its own motivation. They don't need right. to talk about the end destination at all. There's also no mention of a reason for this war or for this. I mean, you know, historically we know why, but they're not talking about, hey, we got to do this strategically so we can win this to do what's right sure. for this, you know, for our America. Right. It's none of that. It's just senseless. They want it to seem as senseless as possible. Mm -hmm. They want a bridge. We want the bridge. It, they're playing capture the flag. You know yeah. what I mean? Nobody ever goes, well, what is the flag for? Why do we, what are we going to do with the flag yeah, the when flag we get it? The flag is for winning. Yeah, it's for winning. You just get the fucking flag. You capture the bridge. He also talks, uh, you know, Joe. I'm going to call him Joe because I think it's funny from the other movies. But the man with no name, mm -hmm. um, Blondie, also talks about how he's never seen so many men wasted so badly. Right. And I think it's... Uh, you know, it's odd that they're getting away with this moment here, and maybe that's what is the most interesting to me about these conversations about war, because they're criticizing war itself and managing to do what in a modern movie I think would come off as really preachy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sure. If this were uh, the war in Afghanistan, then it, and this kind of music was playing in the background, and you know, this tough guy was standing up with a tear in one eye and going, wow, just... So much, so many men wasted so badly today. So much senseless violence. Everybody sure. would go, come on, give me a fucking break. Yeah. But, you know, you don't hear. 
And I don't know, is that part of the Western thing? Is it because it's the Civil War? I mean, how are they getting away with this? A big part of it is you don't even realize the conversation is happening because it's the first time exposition takes place in its entirety over one conversation. I think by the time you realize what's being said, everything is so slow paced. But they're it, giving it to you pretty heavy, don't you? I no, mean, they are. I definitely the, kneeling think they down are. to the last moments of a sure. dying soldier. <laughs> sure, you know, somehow it still feels uh, it feels profound instead of eye rolling, and that's yeah, really I strange agree. to me. Yeah, this is also one of those moments. I mean, when we talked about the exploitative nature of a spaghetti western, uh, this is a lot more. I think like the classic, more traditional type of western. Yeah, agreed. Well, where when you we're start delivering a moral message of of some sort, sure. And when you start getting into the senseless violence of a civil war, that's when Hollywood westerns really come into you know come into view. Sure, sure. And I don't think that's any surprise that we're getting it of the three Leone films from the most popular one. Sure, from one that people don't you know often don't know is considered part of at least a spiritual trilogy of uh of films mm -hmm. but lo and behold the one that most resembles a traditional western happens to be the most popular of the of the films right i don't think that's without you know reason or merit beyond its formula though i mean there's a lot of stuff in here that's emblematic of traditional westerns but really at the peak of its you know stuff like the dialogue yeah you get this sage-like advice from all these guys and it's written in a way that is really, really memorable. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. It sounds like something the audience is shouting at the, right. you know, why does everyone always stand around talking with their guns out? They should just shoot the other guy. Yeah. And uh, it cuts back to Eastwood and he says something like, um, every gun makes its own tune or something like that. Yeah. You know, Westerns have these kind of wise men once said, uh, straight talking, you know, it's part of that culture. Mm-hmm. And then also, I think this movie has probably the ultimate Mexican standoff type showdown scene. Oh, yeah. I would submit that this is, without dispute, probably the most iconic standoff in cinema history. Yeah, I think so, too. I think just the image of it seems to be something that everyone's familiar with. Well, you've built the whole movie around these three guys. You call the movie the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then here they are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right. All standing here, you know, with their guns pointed at each other. Leone has been big for these kind of standoff scenes, and Westerns in general. But here they are. This isn't just, uh, oh, everybody saw it in this movie and started doing it in other places. This wasn't the beginning or the origin. Right. It's notable just because it's really fucking good. Yeah. Just because it's a great moment where it seems like the scene is lingering forever. Everybody, it's bringing everybody up to speed. They want everybody to know, hey, here you are caught in a standoff. Make no mistake mm -hmm. about it. The tension is ridiculously high. Shoots one guy. And then you start thinking, well, what what about the other guy? You're not going to shoot right. the other guy? Well, it's it's this fantastic thing that seems like, how did nobody think of this before? What happens when there's three guys and everybody only has one gun? Then you have this moment and what you're doing in that moment is kind of the same thing every character is supposed to be doing, which is, Who's going to hit me? Yeah. You, yeah, you're you start, looking to win. You're trying to play for endgame here. You have, to, you have to look at the other two guys in this scene and go, which one is going to shoot me? Sure. Because I should shoot that one. And which one is a buffoon who can't fire his fucking gun? Right. But that's the thing is every single one of them has been a pretty steady marksman throughout the film. Sure. That's true. You don't have a clear which one's going to miss. Right. Right. If anything, you have, am I the one that's going to miss? Yeah. Yeah, Mexican standoff is an interesting kind of setup because you have all of these things going on in people's head. I mean, you're setting up a trap. You're setting up this uh, this kind of machine that's going to run, this almost Rube Goldberg kind of thing uh -huh. where you're going, all right, I'm going to lay out my strategy. I'm going to pick all my moves, and then at some point I'm going to execute my plan. And so that moment there where nobody is shooting, everybody has to make these judgments. It's mm -hmm. about not just the fact there's tension, but what is hanging in the air at sure. that moment. They're not waiting just because it's dramatic. Yeah. They're waiting because they're not, none of them is sure which move to make. Yeah. And the first person to make a move is the first one that officially decides, all right, this is what I'm going with. Yeah. And the other two have to then go, all right, we're going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because it is advantageous 
especially from a movie that just pointed out, don't talk, just shoot. Mm -hmm. It's not going back on that. Yeah, it would be advantageous to shoot immediately, but everybody's kind of stuck, frozen, going, what is the right move to make? Mm -hmm. You want to make it as fast as possible, but you don't want to make it a second before you have to. You want to have all, right. the, all the possible yeah. information. So, you know, you Sergio Leone stare down everybody else and try and predict when they're about to shoot. So you can shoot just a second before, have the maximum amount of time to have, uh, have planned this and still do it right before the other guy does. Um, let's talk about Godzilla. I like to think of this as a Godzilla world tour. This is, yeah, um, it is, it's uh, millennium era Godzilla. Yeah. It's the, yeah. It's millennium era, which is man, millennium era. So we did, we did, um, the first era, which was the, uh, that's the, uh, Shawa series is yeah, first. Yeah. And then, and then we have the, uh, Issei or Heisei series second. And those two are, I mean, they're clearly different because there's 20 years in between. Right. But they still generally seem to have the same grasp on what's going on. Sure. The thing about the Millennium series, and I think it's perfect that you call it a world tour, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you give us the rundown in a second, but I think the thing that's bizarre about the Millennium series is that the Hisei series is so much America has seen the original Toho films mm. and is just trying to make them. Sure. And it's sure. fine because they're, the Toho movies are being made for America now. But then we have Roland Emmerich's Godzilla. And that is the first time America has straight up been, we can do Godzilla. And Toho goes, really? That's, <laughs> that's Godzilla to you? Because that's not what Godzilla is to us. And so Toho comes back and starts making Godzilla again. But it's so much has happened in the film and, and television world of Japanese cinema. You have things like anime. You have things like um, the Power Rangers. Yeah. Stuff that has taken off in Japanese cinema has so heavily influenced what's going on in these movies now. Plus, it's, you know, the year 2000, we have fucking CG. Yes. Um, so you have to draw the line between, well, do we remain true to the original films and do we do the suitmation or do we go ahead and do CG. I think one of the cleverest things they've done is made Zilla CG the whole time. Right. Um, to kind of go, yeah, way to go America. This is what <laughs> your monster looks like. I didn't, uh, I didn't put that together until just now. That's wonderful. Yeah, man. They have, uh, they have their finger on so many of these things. It's just such perfect commentary about, you know, this is kind of an anniversary film, right? It's yeah. this, uh, mm -hmm. sort of look back at, I mean, the title sequence recounts previously on Godzilla, you know. Sure. It's saying, uh, look at everything that's, that's come up to this point. Now you're combining all the monsters. And uh, until I saw this for uh, the show, I was always questioning you, you know, why not do Mothra in the last one? Why return right. to Godzilla? And this turns out to be the perfect conclusion for us. Yeah. It's, um, it's not the first time I think this has been done. Uh, I've heard oh, a lot no. about destroy all monsters, and I don't know if yeah. you. I honestly yeah. don't destroy know anything all about that. And all monsters, all out attack. So that's those are, kind of the, those are back in the Shawa series, yeah. So these are, you know, they're they're very uh, heavy. Get all the monsters together, world tour type films, but sure. they're pretty old. Yeah, well, they're they're from the first series, and so we're talking what sixties or seventies, right? I think it's yeah. Early 70s, 74, 75. Mm. Yeah, and then we have this... Okay, so tell me if you saw this, but we have this thing that doesn't happen in the previous two series, which is that there's a plot yeah, outside sure. of There Are Monsters. I don't know what you're talking about. But did you notice that this plot is basically, oh no, Scientology's happening? No. <laughs> what? Okay, so think about this. No, think about this. The whole plot is based about how Gigan has part of his... Gigan is like the supreme evil, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then King Ghidorah is the supremer evil. Okay. But Gigan is the supreme evil. And part of Gigan has gotten into all of these people, and that's why they're mutants, but that's also why they can be controlled, and everybody's trying to like fight the intrinsic evil inside of them. Interesting. Is that not the basic tenet of Scientology? Giant alien right. put bad aliens in a volcano and they exploded and now people have midichlorians or whatever the fuck? Thetans, I believe, is yeah, the... Yeah, whatever. <laughs> sure. 
Um, so my point is that I don't even know if Scientology is something that the film was aware of, but it's done such a wonderful job of going, look how silly, because <laughs> it's the, the plot of Scientology, and I say plot very, very deliberately. Yes, is that <laughs> there's a bunch of monsters and they're all bad. And then you put them in a volcano and they explode and now people are bad. Well, this is a movie about how there's a bunch of monsters and they're all bad. And then there are also bad people. And then there's one like supreme bad monster, but then there's an even supremer bad monster, which in my opinion is L. Ron Hubbard for making the whole thing up. <laughs> um, but my point is that, that I guess my point is not, but what I should be saying here is that there's a really, really in-depth plot with the people in this sure. film. Something we haven't seen previously because the plot tends to be, oh no, Godzilla's attacking. How do we stop him? Well, that yeah. That didn't work. It, we've always had people around and sometimes sure. you know, we follow them to more or less of an extent. But this has uh, people as kind of the focus. I mean, not just the focus, but an, an interesting science fiction element in and of the, you know, they're mutants, right? I mean, that's right. the thing. This could just be a movie about mutants, but it's a movie about mutants who have their cities attacked by giant monsters who also fight like they're from the Matrix. Right, yeah. Am I not supposed to call the movie out on that? Or uh, You know, I think you're allowed to. I mean, it's complete with bullet time, camera, yeah. and techno music. And... Trench coats. Oh, my God. It feels like one of those movies that's, you know, up the ante. Mm -hmm. This movie's got it all. Sure. We've got monsters. We've got Godzilla. We right. got 15 fucking monsters and the Matrix. That's the thing that's bizarre is when you look back in 1964 when Gojira comes out and America is so awed by this big monster. Oh, my God, that's so badass. Mm -hmm. This movie is just, again, trying to make the audience go, oh, my God, that's so badass. Right. So much so that there's a roundhouse kick with a motorcycle. Sure. I mean, this film is not fucking around. It's a badass monster movie. It's just that the monsters aren't really what's going on. They're, they're a symptom of the actual plot sure. for the first time in double feature history. You can tell the movie's not fucking around. You just need to look at that American guy's mustache. Right. I don't know who that guy is. I don't know <laughs> what he's doing here. You know what I do love is, uh, speaking of the American stuff, Japan's view of New York City. <laughs> yeah. Just makes me laugh. For the first yeah. hour of the movie. It's so good. When they cut to New York and there's a guy in a giant furry coat and yep. he's got a classic car and hot Purple pink. hot rod. Yeah, yeah, and there's just a beat cop and yeah. the whole thing is so fucking ridiculous. Sure. It makes you think yeah. about, you know, our portrayal of Japan in all of our movies and how ridiculous it right. probably is. Yeah, it's true. But then also seeing Japan's take on New York destruction. Right. Because we get to see New York style destruction through Hollywood's eyes all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, New York's probably the most destroyed city on earth. I think it actually is. I think there's a list somewhere of most destroyed city on the earth. Yeah. And I think outside of Osaka. I was going to say Washington, too. Uh, Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah. Washington, D.C. and Osaka and New York City are way up there. Also, obviously, L.A. Because right. Yeah, I guess that, too. That's where aliens like to go. L.A. is not a city, though. That doesn't count. They have, like, three buildings that are taller than two stories. <laughs> Uh, anyways, makes can, it easy. Should we talk about the monsters then? I would love more than anything in the world to talk about the monsters, Eric. Um, I know there's a lot. There's so many. Uh, where where do we start? Obviously, we have Godzilla, although he's not the forerunner in the film. Initially, it starts with what Rodan. Sure. They talk about Gigan, then Gigan shows up. We have uh, Hedora has a brief cameo, and Anguirus is is doing some major damage. And Zilla, those are the those are the ones that do some serious damage. So Rodan's um, the the pterodactyl, Rodan is the pterodactyl kind of thing, pterodactyl, right? Right. Hedora, Hedora gets is the thrown into a building. Bug eyed alien, sort of. Yeah, he's the smog monster. He was right, in Godzilla versus right. the smog monster. In the fashion of uh, Atomic Age cautionary messages, we have the right. space age sludge monster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah true to form. So yeah, then there's the uh, the other three: the lobster, the sea monster, the spider, and the mantis. But I don't know their Japanese Abira, names. Abira, uh, and then the spider starts with a K. Uh, Kumanga, I think. I have Kumanga, no idea what the right. the mantis is though. But then we also have so there's there's Mila, but that's a whole different sure. aspect of the film. But there's Manda. Oh yeah, and yeah. Manda yeah. is right at the beginning of the film, and Manda come. Manda gets destroyed really early on. That's the kind of dragon Chinese dragon. Yeah. 
one. He's the yeah. Chinese dragon type thing. Oh wait, um, did we address? Uh, I didn't want to derail you there, but King Caesar. Oh yeah, <laughs> I don't King think Caesar just is the most ridiculous monster. It's so weird. While I'm trying to remember back to, yeah. uh, he's like a wrestle rabbit. <laughs> oh my god. So Manda is actually interesting in Toho cinema and in Kaiju cinema because mm. Manda never gets its own film. Manda is actually, and I think you're going to really love this, Manda is in a film called Atragon, which is, it's, uh, it's about an undersea warship, which is that drill ship that they're flying in the entire oh, movie. Oh, sure. So Atragon is actually another aspect of Toho Cinema that they've integrated, is this fucking warship. Oh, interesting. Which is why Atragon versus Manda is the first thing that happens, and then <laughs> sure. they about Manda. And right. then Atragon is still the fucking battleship for the rest of the film. And that's before Zilla gets his uh, five seconds of fame. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best fight scene ever. Yeah. I was wondering, too, if you think that Final Wars is a movie that's kind of self-aware. If they're going for, you know, I think about that scene where, you know, throwing Zilla into the opera house and kind of how mm -hmm. it blows up. Yeah. Are they going for kitschy effects? Is that something that's... You know, I, I think that we always have trouble dealing with Asian cinema in this way. We don't know if they're being funny or if it's just the kind of thing where special effects don't matter that much to them. Right. If that's just how, you know, if that's um, tradition. Well, I just think that a lot of times they put a movie together and they go, well, it doesn't look real, but I mean, it's oh. giant monsters. Oh, so you're thinking of like the Ichi split in half kind of uh, Right, kind of exactly. Thing. Right, yeah. right. But I do think it's got to be at least in some respects self-aware. You don't put Zilla into a movie if you're not self-aware. Yeah, right. You don't have Son of Godzilla show up. Yeah. You don't, uh, you don't have chainsaw hands. Sure. In a film that's not at least partially self-aware. Speaking of which, we forgot to mention Mothra, but shout out to Mothra. Oh, yeah, right. Mothra, who maybe gets away in the end. I love Mothra. I hope she lives on forever and ever. But I hope those fucking twins die. I hate the twins. I hate them. <laughs> I've hated them since the first Mothra movie. Hold on. Let's stick with uh, Mila for a second. I'm sorry, Mila. Because I'm dying Mila to talk. Mila or Nilla or Manila. Let's talk about Manila for a moment. Okay. <laughs> Mila, that's one of the effects, actually, that I think was really good. It's just that moment where Mila sees... Uh, I never thought an effect with Mila would be the one that I'm excited about. Yeah. But Mila sees Godzilla from the ground uh, off in the distance. Godzilla just looks great off in the distance. Yeah. And I think a lot of the moves, too, in a similar way... I always hate referencing uh, other Asian movies we've done because it seems like a forced tie-in or maybe my mind's just on that uh -huh. but it reminds me of a lot of the tokyo gore police kind of we're just trying to get as inventive as possible with uh what these monsters are doing how they're fighting sure you know we've been doing this a long time now the fights are getting really really slick for right you know two monsters if you if you had no idea about kaiju or that it's existed or culturally what it was then this would look so fucking insane the way these monsters are fighting. Mm -hmm. But you have the background. You know Japan has been doing this for decades. Sure. And so now you can have slick monster fights because right. they've, just, they've done everything else. I want to talk about Milo because I, it's such a, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the age of mean monsters and mean Godzilla. Yeah, right. Where the fuck did Milo come from? There's a movie called Son of Godzilla. Uh, it happened um, pretty early on. Mm-hmm. And it's this movie about how Godzilla has a little kid and the kid is benevolent. And Godzilla, I think, especially in this film, if we're going by D&D &D terms, uh, Godzilla can be construed as chaotic good. Sure. Because he defends the planet. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> right. But that doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't kill people. A little bit of an anti-hero. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Nilla, Milla, Manila is, he's a... He's too cute to be bad. Sure. So he ends up being this benevolent kind of force that prevents the chaotic destruction that would otherwise come from, from Godzilla. And that's actually where the spider comes from is in, and I think also the mantis or one or the other comes from son of Godzilla. Sure. But Mila is this little baby Godzilla and he wants really badly to be a Godzilla, but he can't quite pull it off until the sure. end of Godzilla Final Wars. Yeah, the little puff of smoke is probably yeah, yeah. adorable. Yeah, the happens. adorable monster. It, right. He's the adorable monster, but he also becomes this voice he's he's the he's 
almost the missing link between humankind and <laughs> kaiju kind because he's the only one who knows what it's like to be small in a world of big monsters. Wow. I don't even know where we go from there. <laughs> All right. So we have a website, uh, doublefeatureshow.com, and the email address is, as always, doublefeatureshow uh, at gmail.com. Well, goddamn. And that's, I guess that's the end of uh, the Leone stuff and the, uh, the kaiju stuff. Although, you know, this was the last Godzilla film, the one we talked about today. But uh, apparently, and I know you mentioned this in the first episode, I have this great degree of skepticism about new movie announcements because I feel like I've been burned so yeah. many times. We talked about two Godzilla movies that were in development uh -huh. back on the first time we did the show, and yeah. still neither are here. Yeah, although they have, there's, there seems to be some forward movement on the new American Godzilla um, that's supposed to be 2014, right? Isn't that right, the talk? Yeah. But it's the it's the fellow that directed Monsters. I don't know if anybody's seen it. It'll probably end up on the show. Sure. It has some definite notable elements. Well, it's also um, David S. Goyer. Uh, yeah. Guy who did Flash Forward, showrunner on there, I think. He did all the mm -hmm. Dark Knight stuff. He's supposed to be doing, yeah. I think, the latest rewrite. The guy from The Expendables was on it at right. some point. Yeah, I think, that, I think that there's a lot of potential. There seems to be a lot more... Um, respect and attention to the toho stuff right so i think that uh it might it might be something definitely worth a look can i give you breaking news on double feature this is please, exciting please this is what doing your show on an ipad looks like i can hit some buttons over here legendary has set an announced uh date of may 16th 2014 for the godzilla film for the new godzilla film apparently awesome. it's got a release date so pumped um, we should do that, and uh, I don't know, like Once Upon a Time in the West or something. There may be hope uh, for this series in the future. If we be... start watching Once Upon a Time in the West right now, we'll actually finish it by May 16th, 2014. Yeah, that's true. So uh, With no bathroom breaks. What are we doing next time on Double Feature? Uh, next time, speaking of The Expendables, uh, we're going to do uh, two action-packed action hero films. We're going to do Arnold Schwarzenegger's kindergarten cop and sly stallone's stop or my mom will shoot uh so goddamn excited so watch more fucking film bye